a healthcare business podcast from the Coker Group that focuses on solutions to help healthcare organizations effectively navigate the changing healthcare industry landscape. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with Coker. Uh, my name is Mark Reibel, and I am the host. And today's episode, we're actually talking with Max Reibel, who's back. He's been on a few times. And uh, Max is the CEO of Coker. And um, many of our listeners probably know him or know of him. But today, he and I are having a conversation on a topic that touches on a number of different things, I guess. And it's a topic that we're talking about a number of different things related to the overall category and will be here in the future as well. But we're talking about private equity deals. Again, we've talked a little bit about this in past episodes, uh, but this time we're specifically talking about management services organizations as it relates to private equity deals. And so we use the term MSO for management services organizations interchangeably with BSO, which is business services organization. Um, same thing, just, you know, different people call them different things. Uh, but Max and I talk about a number of different things related to MSOs, kind of how they've evolved, what are they? Um, and then their the growing role of these types of entities in private equity deals, specifically when a physician group uh, does a deal with private equity sponsor. And um, there, there's a role here for uh, additional value potentially for the seller. And um, and then there's kind of different nuances as far as how these entities are valued, how they actually work and, and, and generate revenue from a management fee. And, um, and then how ultimately that value is allocated uh, upon sale and what kind of happens post-transaction with the owners going forward. So um, it's a good conversation. Like I said, we touch on a number of different things, bounce around a little bit. There was a lot of interesting points and takeaways that I think would be relevant to our audience who either already have an MSO, perhaps, or maybe they're considering building, developing an MSO and uh, potentially selling it private equity. So we hope you enjoy this episode. And as always, we invite you all to, um, you can follow us on social media so you can get updates on future podcast episodes. You can listen to this episode and all of our episodes on our website at coffeewithcoker.com. Um, and you can also find those at cokergroup.com as well. Uh, but with that, we hope you enjoy this conversation with Max Rival. Thanks for listening. All right, well, welcome back to another episode. And we are today talking with Max Rival, the CEO of Coker Group. Today, we're talking again about private equity deals and some of the trends we've seen in these deals uh, that we've been a part of and advising our clients and just some of the things we're seeing out in the marketplace. And it's a little bit of a nuanced component to these deals. And uh, and we've talked about what private equity transactions look like, some of the key trends and things like that in other episodes. In this discussion, we're specifically talking about the formation and uh, sale, I guess, or, or the kind of the inclusion of an MSO or a management services organization. An MSO uh, is one of those things that's not, not necessarily new to healthcare. We've seen various forms of MSOs over the years or even decades. And uh, I would say becoming more commonplace. And we're seeing more of these, uh, particularly as you're seeing more groups, physician groups uh, growing in size and kind of consolidating and going to these, uh, sometimes you call them super groups or just you know larger entities. And so we thought it'd be good to talk about this because we're also seeing this as a key component of some of these transactions that groups are doing and physicians are doing with private equity investors. You know, I guess a good way to start is let's talk about what is an MSO? I think that I think we need to define that because again, these aren't new, um, but we're, we're definitely seeing more of them. And and by the way, you'll probably hear us use the term MSO as well as the term BSO. So there's management services organizations and business services organizations. These are the same thing. So we'll use those terms interchangeably. Uh, but maybe let's just start there as far as defining an MSO and kind of then we can tie that to how we're seeing them play out in these private equity deals. Sure. And good to be with you again today. So BSOs, MSOs, whatever you choose to call them, are um, pretty much the way the terms infer management services organizations, business services organizations. And what they really entail is a, quite frankly, wide spectrum of 
entities or services that would be provided on a contractual basis. So in many instances, practices, particularly those that are, let's say, usually a little larger, single or multi-specialty, and they have, for various reasons, determined strategically that it is in their best interest to spin off and create within their administrative and and non-clinical portions of their practice, this separate legal entity. And that MSO or BSO uh, forms its own individual identity, if you will, both legally and otherwise. The first and oftentimes the only client is practice. So there is a contractual arrangement for services, management services, uh, between the practice and the MSO at BSO. And then naturally there's a fee assigned to that. We're going to move on in our discussion today, so I'll stop there. Uh, but mainly we're going to be putting it in the context of private equity and related transactions. That's where it really uh, comes into play. I think that's a good segue. So when we when we think about these types of entities involved in these transactions, I guess let's break it down or, or, or I guess set it up, right? So you have a, a private equity investor. They're coming in and they're say, they say, we are interested in this group or this specialty and they're coming to a market and they want to buy this, this practice. Mm-hmm. What we're essentially saying is there's another potential opportunity for value for that seller, those physicians, those partners in that practice to achieve value through the sale, well, I guess through the formation of an MSO, if there's not already one. And then they sell that entity along with the practice to the private equity investor. And so what does that look like? I mean, how does sure. that tie in? How does that even start? Well, we often use the term uh, enterprise. And, and so when a BSO accompanied by a practice or vice versa exists, and if both are in play vis-a-vis the private equity transaction, then uh, that's the entire enterprise. So in effect, what may have been one practice with administrative structure is now a BSO with administrative services only and a practice with the professional side and potentially some ancillary services. Why do we do this? Well, uh, believe it or not, on some occasions, the actual transaction only involves one or the other entity, or if it involves both, the strategic plan for the BSO may be more akin to taking this out to other practices that are affiliated or not affiliated with the private equity firm. So it really becomes a service in and of itself. We've seen some transactions that only entail the BSO. One comes to mind in the Northeast that Mark, you and I worked on, where it was a large or is a large multi-specialty group. Uh, Even prior to a uh, private entity, it really wasn't private equity, but a private entity sale, um, you know, we helped them carve out and create the MSO. So the MSO has value and obviously is is structured in such a way that its fees create an earnings, an EBITDA, and that is a launch point for creating value. So it, it's just another mechanism of value that's created. The enterprise itself uh, typically would be that entire entity, in other words, the practice and the uh, MSO, BSO. So yeah. it, it's really... You know, not necessarily one size fits all. It's every transaction. They've you've heard the saying: if you've seen one transaction, you've seen one transaction. Well, that's somewhat the case here. Yeah, I think that's a good distinction too, because I, I guess at a base from a from a baseline standpoint, a group, a single practice, let's say a um, OBGYN group or a pediatric group, may set up this MSO just for their group. And they may say, you know, we have 50 physicians, this this MSO or BSO supports uh, us with the uh, billing, collections, rev cycle. And we'll talk about kind of what services can be entailed in this in a minute. But but then there's kind of the next layer of, all right, not only are we supporting our group, but we've built this infrastructure to support our group. Why can't this same infrastructure be leveraged to support other groups and derive a fee from that? And that creates additional value beyond just whatever management fee they're getting from their own group. And I think that's where we've seen these really grow. 
Right. And that's where I think a lot of the interest can be, particularly from outside investors, because, um, you know, you may be support, you may end up, and we've seen this happen where one BSO came out of one single practice, but grew over time to maybe be supporting hundreds more physicians and groups, whether it's in that market or maybe beyond that market, but um, they have that infrastructure there and they can provide the same suite of services to, you know, any number of doctors mm-hmm. and then, you know, derive a fee from that. Yeah. Or it can be a menu of services that certain practices subscribe to, not right. all of them. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to slice and dice this. Another example would be real estate. Maybe mm-hmm. The BSO in particular, these days it would probably be, not to get too technical, a BSO that would include real estate and and it could be uh, even a landlord of sorts that would uh, go through the provision of real estate services, you know, medical office building, et cetera, to various clients and, and back to the practice. I think the other thing that's noteworthy here is one of the distinctions when we create a BSO or MSO entity is that uh, oftentimes there may be different owners vis-a-vis the owners of the practice. Uh, And again, real estate come into play here. So for example, maybe you have a practice that has, uh, let's make the numbers easy, 20 partners, and you have 10 additional, let's say junior, not really partners, but in, in individuals that are on various tracks, timing and otherwise, to become a partner when this deal's done. One of the things that a group might do as they form their BSO is to provide, let's just say, quicker, sooner equity interest in the BSO for those associates or those, let's use the term even probationary partners, and, and give them a, a, a piece of the apple, as it were, of the private equity deal. So again, there's no particular right or wrong uh, or you know prescription that has to be followed here. Uh, we'll get to how profits and distributions are allocated here in a moment. That, that could come into play a little bit more from a legal perspective. But for now, uh, these BSOs, MSOs can really function as a real tool mm-hmm. to provide some variety and I guess you'd say expedient distributions of the deals. It's if you have a private equity deal and you have, in my example, two thirds of your physicians that are partners and one third that are not, obviously the partners would be the only ones that would vote to do the deal, but they sure better have those other 10 on board. Mm -hmm. And even though they don't, because they're not going to get a distribution of the proceeds of the sale of the practice or anything else they don't have any equity in. And yet they are very much a part of that EBITDA figure that the value is being based upon. So yeah. all these things have to be uh, considered in the equation. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk valuation too. But I think that's a, a good point in that there are, like you said, there's, there's a lot of nuanced, uh, well, different characteristics, unique characteristics as far as um, some of these different deals. But the the key is i believe that it gives opportunity for variety as far as how, where you can um, derive additional value or, and and potentially allocate additional value to your partners or, mm-hmm. or even non-partners but let's talk for a second before we dive into valuation though i, I want to talk about two things services and the fee because those are things that can vary as well. And we already alluded to services. And I think um, that is we can quickly just kind of cover all a number of the different things that potentially can be included and uh, that we see often. And but then that fee is critical, obviously, because there's a fee, there's a component to that that is related to the value of the entity itself. But there's also kind of how that fee impacts the practice as well, how it impacts the physicians within that practice in that group. And so let's just maybe let's start with services and let's mm-hmm. talk about some of the things we've seen from the different BSOs we've seen out there. You know, it's a, uh, it's a great question. And once again, a very a varied one as tar- far as answers go. So let me give you a couple of examples. We, we worked with one, they still call it an MSO, in in the again in the northeast not too long ago and that entity 
really created was created for the sole purpose of transferring value out of the practice and into the MSO. And as such, the services were really executive services only. It included, it's a good size practice, so it included the CEO, I think the CFO, and maybe the director of marketing, maybe COO uh, as well. Their overhead was essentially transferred into this management entity and nothing else. And furthermore, the management fee, and I know we're going to get to that too, but in this instance was a 20% of revenue, you could do it in that state, uh, management fee. So what we had done was we had simply taken the profit out of the practice, put it into the MSO because it had very little overhead. And all of the services resided at the practice. Well, not surprisingly, the private equity entity was was only purchasing the MSO. The practice, in this case, was not sold. So the value was transferred over to the MSO. Now, more typically, that is not what I've seen as typical arrangement. The more typical one is all of the administrative side, essentially everybody but the nurses, the clinical staff. And the overhead that goes with that, and obviously the physicians and other providers, all of the other things, non-provider based, if you will, uh, are moved over into the BSO, MSO. And those services that you would predictably uh, think would be provided, billing, front office, scheduling, EHR, uh, you know, practice management, uh, all of your typical non-clinical functions, even would the be, personnel. Yeah, and the hiring, absolutely and the personnel yeah. cost uh, that goes with those, which is your largest expense in any medical practice. All those are moved over to the MSO. In turn, the fees are subscriptive in the sense that your client, let's just say it is the practice in this case, uh, would presumably subscribe to all non clinical services. And so the fee would either be fixed with a slight variable tied to some metric. In most states, you can do it based on a percentage of revenue, some you can't, or some other metric involved. And uh, essentially, that's the fee. And so that's the services are, again, very uh, menu oriented. Now, when a BSO might go to an outside practice or Another practice that the private equity firm uh, controls, if you will, and needs those services, then uh, that could be set up in such a way where, again, the services are defined and then the fees commensurate with that. One last thing I'll say is oftentimes a private equity firm, I know you and I have worked on one in the dermatology space, for example, and they'll... Uh, maybe have a strategy to go into a particular state, and they call it, sometimes they'll plant the flag with a singular practice. And then from there, they'll take that that practice and use it as a foundation, sometimes spinning off an MSO to acquire other smaller practices and essentially build a regional presence. And they'll use the wherewithal of that original practice and potentially a spun off MSO, BSO as the administrative uh, services uh, entity. And some will provide some services even from a corporate standpoint to muddy the water even more. So those are often the strategies behind the creation of these uh, these yeah. entities. Yeah, I, I know typically just for our folks listening, the the initial, whether it's the initial acquisition or like I didn't, like you said, the entree into a new market, uh, the, that'll be called the you know, the platform acquisition, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the planning of the flag. And so, usually, there's two key things there. Usually, the the buyer is going to be looking for a strong group that can perform right. that function. So, that's right. so if you have that existing infrastructure in place, you may be more of a um, of a priority target, a priority candidate, I guess, than some this something that doesn't. Now, the the second part of that, and this goes directly hand in hand, but because you have that existing infrastructure and because you are the platform transaction, platform entity, then you 
ideally can get a premium valuation for that because they're buying that infrastructure. There's value. Right. There's additional value beyond versus if you're an add on acquisition. And I think that's something we see. And, you know, I think there's cases where some opportunity, maybe some dollars have been left on the table because that's been missed. But I think that's that's a key distinction. So as these groups are exploring potential buyers or partners, investors, and they're considering different offers, that could be something that's a key negotiating point on the seller side, uh, making sure you're getting all that value. Right. Um, the, the other thing I was going to say, just closing the loop on services, not, we've seen these uh, MSOs, BSOs, where they do, they offer all those things, like you said, literally the entire business function of that entity is in this MSO. We've also seen it though, where it's the other, the opposite end of that spectrum, where maybe all they do is billing, all they do is processing claims, and uh, you know, and managing a portion of rev cycle. And uh, there's still value in those. And so we see a, a wide variation on these deals. We we get asked a question about, and again, we'll talk about valuation in a second. But we we get asked this question all the time about what's a reasonable multiple. Well, the reality is you got to start considering the deals out there that have been done. If you're looking at platform acquisitions, well, those multiples may be really high. If you're looking at kind of add-on things and all you provide is billing services, well, that's basically, that may be more akin to multiples you'd see for billing companies. Um, so you really have to look the look at the individual cases and the merits of each individual one. And, and I think that leads us into to talk a little bit more about the fee, but Maybe let's just, and and you've talked about this already to a certain extent, but let's just talk kind of break down briefly sure. how the fees are typically structured for these types of entities. Well, ideally, again, um, it would be some metric that's tied to performance. Oftentimes, you will see a minimum fixed fee, particularly if a BSO is providing services for a startup or relatively new entity which hasn't developed the revenue and the volume to typically do it based upon a percent of revenue. Now, before I go any further and our friends from New York that are listening and perhaps other states, I want to say that there are pretty strict limitations on how these entities can charge for their fees. And New York is a good example. We ran into this recently with a client and they cannot, generally speaking, do it on a basis of revenue. So a percent of, of revenue. That is, in fact, the most normal, typical way of doing it. Uh, at least that's what we found over the years. But again, you have to stay within the white lines of legality within each state and the federal government. So most of the time, it would be that. In other places like New York, it might be more of a fixed fee. You know, regardless, you're always going to look at the pro forma as to what services you're provided, what they're going to cost you and then what an appropriate markup would be. So even if it's a fixed fee or mostly fixed fee, you would still simply go through the, the uh, analysis if you're the BSO entity and say, okay, it's going to cost me X uh, to deliver these services. And you know an appropriate profit margin is Y. And you know X plus Y equals whatever the charge is going to be within the typical boundaries of the legal structure within that state. So that's a simplistic way of looking at it, but that's pretty much the way it works. It's, yeah. uh, it's just that simple. Well, and, and I think that's that's right. If you can't blatantly say it's tied to a percentage of collections, you're essentially deriving a fee, a fair fee based on, like you said, that kind of cost plus approach. Right. Um, so, and that's really what the percentage is typically tied to. Now, we have seen those cases where, you know, if they are just providing this service, these services to their own group, like if a group of physicians mm -hmm. start up an MSO and they're only supporting their own practice, they may di they may wish to divert higher uh, amounts of overhead and even their own income from the practice over to this MSO with the intent of selling it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of beef up EBITDA right. and, you know, sell it for a high multiple. Um, so that's a that gets a little murky. Nothing wrong with that because you're selling to a, a willing buyer, a private enterprise. It, this is a little bit of a tangent, but when you're talking about, we've seen a, lot, a number of these deals also go into transactions involving hospitals and health systems, and that's a different 
probably entirely different discussion, yeah, but so. that we should just note that when you get into those cases, you're dealing with fair market value, just like you're dealing with fair market value on the acquisition of a practice, the employment of a doctor, the physician's compensation. Um, you're doing the same thing here. So we, we are often asked, whether it's by a hospital or involved in a transaction where a group is selling to a hospital, what is a reasonable range, uh, a rate? of fees for these management services. And I'll tell you, there, again, is no standard. I know it'd be, it, it, people want to hear it's, uh, you know, five and a quarter percent or 8% or whatever that, you know, but we have literally seen these fees range from 3% of collections to uh, on the very, very high end over 20%. But uh, there's always nuance to that. If you see something on the low end, typically you're just talking about services boiled down to billing and collections. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be very typical for just a standard billing company and what they would typically charge um, on that. When you see those higher fees, that's where they're providing a lot higher, in, a lot more volume and quality higher end services. So they're doing all of that back office stuff, mm -hmm. basically. And when you think about it like that, okay, you can understand, well, that's charging 21%, but that's uh, significant dollars as far as what the cost entailed and the overhead and infrastructure that's required to do that, as well as the expertise and the management leadership and all that stuff. So there's there's a lot of nuance there. Um, again, when you're talking about doing these deals with hospitals, you get into fair market value guidelines, but the, the short answer there, there is no kind of magic formula for how those fees are derived as being fair or not. That going back to these private equity deals, though, again, I think I think the private equity buyers are not ignorant to the fact that there may be kind of a lot of essentially beefed up value, beefed up EBITDA in that management company, but they may be willing to pay a premium for that uh, to get that group on and to maybe you know have that serve as the platform for management services for all their groups that they're going to add on over time. Yeah, there's there's a very different paradigm between hospital and physician group transactions and physician and private equity group. And and of course, running through the central theme of, of both in this context would be the legality. Uh there's there's really not the kinds of things in private equity deals. And as you just said, uh, you know, you can, you know, voila, create value. And EBITDA, uh, just by the stroke of a contractual pen, if you will, uh, within a BSO, whereas within a hospital relationship, it has to be at fair market value. Now, I will say this, and I think sometimes people overlook this, if, if I own a BSO as a private group, and for whatever reason, we do see this every once in a while, I'm providing services to a hospital physician enterprise, I can and probably should have a markup and a profit margin there. There's nothing wrong with a profit margin. It's generally a for-profit company anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it just can't be beyond fair market value. And of course, that's that's the nuance. So yeah. uh, clearly there's, there's opportunities there. But like I said earlier, if you've seen one structure, you've seen one and everyone deserves a unique review and mm -hmm. make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed from legal as well as even a good ROI standpoint. Yeah, that's right. So th this question is kind of maybe a little free uh, consulting advice for for folks out there that may be exploring this. But what what about if you're looking if you're a group and you're looking to sell to private equity, you have good infrastructure in place, but you don't necessarily have an MSO. Mm -hmm. Do you think what are the prospects of basically shifting some of that uh, administrative overhead into another entity and selling that, even though, you know, it's almost like, is it really an MSO? Right. It's just, it's, I mean, what, what are kind of, are there, are there, I guess, clear lines and is that something that people should look at? Well, I think, yeah, you should look at it. Uh, I think it's, it's a tougher sell if you're, talking to private equity and you don't really have a track record or any history of a BSO type entity to all of a sudden create one and presumably create more value. Uh, but having said that, uh, it's often done and it clearly is a strategy for groups to create these two separate entities. And 
create some sort of value in in the management entity. And so uh, clearly it it could create a better EBITDA. I think, you know, not to change the subject, but I think uh, the more greater opportunity, well, let's just say as good opportunity for a private equity deal, and particularly if you're a surgical group, would be if you can bring in uh, an AST mm-hmm. into the equation. Now, again, that's a completely separate uh, entity. We're not talking about a management company now, but if, let's just say it's an orthopedic group. And if the individual orthopedist, which they often do have equity interest in an ASC, but let's say they may or may not have controlling interest, uh, their influence to the ASC entity could be such where, believe it or not, we've seen some offers where the EBITDA multiple for the practice would be higher if the surgeons could deliver the ASC as a separate deal. And uh, believe me, I'm not going to opine on the legality of that. I don't, I don't think it's illegal, but you should really get a, an attorney, a healthcare attorney's uh, input on that. But we have seen those where ASCs enhance the value, not just the BSO, that you ask about, but again, not to change the subject, but I think it's relevant to, to look at, you know, ancillary entities yeah. like ASCs as well. Well, and like you said, you alluded to earlier, real estate, it's, yeah, it's real very estate. similar, uh-huh. um, whatever you can kind of add into the quote unquote enterprise. Well, let's, let's break down valuation then. I, I mean, I think, again, this is another very common question uh, we get. And obviously when we're working on these transactions, this is something that probably where we're going to start, honestly, uh, as far as looking at evaluating the value. So walk us through kind of the, the basic valuation approach and some of the nuance there. Sure. And, and, you know, I like to keep things as simple as possible. And really, valuation, regardless of the two major, there's three approaches, the cost, the income, and the market approaches. The cost approach is rarely used. It's more of a look back at the balance sheet. And for obvious reasons, it's it's not, doesn't have, as I call it, the sizzle of interest. So you're really usually left with a market or income approach. The income approach uh, is typically used through a discounted cash flow methodology, which is based on a historical normalized P&L or bottom line excess earnings derived. And then that amount is capitalized and discounted back to present value over a a future projection model uh, using an appropriate capitalization rate. The market approach is uh, more typical, quite frankly, in a, and I should have said the income approach is more typical in a hospital transaction, usually. The market approach, which is more typical in a private equity or or even a practice-to-practice transaction, if you will, is is often used on the market uh, for that and and is simply a multiple of EBITDA, earnings before income taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Now, what I was starting to say a minute ago, and I'll finally get to it now, is that either methodology, either approach really comes down to a relationship of historical and or projected future profits. That's really what it boils down to, either one. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that profitability exists or is projected to exist, that's really what we use under either approach to derive value. The derivation of that profit is usually the subjective part of it. Uh, We use the term, I used it a minute ago, normalizing. And typically what that means is that if there are any uh, expenses that are not anticipated in the future, or if there's revenue that isn't existent today, but there's genuine substantiation that it's going to happen, and, and it really has to be more than just a wink and a nod and a hope, it has to be real, then we can restate or normalize the P&L and use that as a basis for future valuation. Uh, multiples are all over the page. Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit ago about you were alluding to mark the mul- multiples and whatnot, and I, I would say um, it's all market driven. Uh, 
uh, what a multiple for a practice, a surgical practice, VSO, ASC, real estate today uh, may be you know, 20% higher or lower next year at this time. And that's very much a market-driven thing. At this point, as we sit here today towards the end of 2019, um, it looks like multiples are, we keep kind of saying this, they keep going up for healthcare entities. And so uh, it's really a good time. Uh, who knows? Next year, we have an election. Next year, after that, we have a new uh, uh, Congress and all bets are off. Who knows what will happen at that point? But, you know, everything is market driven. And that's why uh, even if you are a private equity or private practice entity and not necessarily bound as strictly by the regulations of valuation, our opinion is, and of course we're biased, I admit it, is to always go out and get an independent valuation. Somebody that knows and keeps track of these market trends, does this work all the time, and will be able to keep you up to date on the current multiples, et cetera. Yeah. Well, again, I think the the value there is not only in being able to serve as an independent perspective uh, and that, that, you know, has the expertise to apply different methodologies, but has the perspective as well of seeing these deals. Because how many times have we heard working with a client or maybe on behalf of a buyer, I'm such and such orthopedic group looking to sell. I know my GI buddies uh, across town just got this their deal and they got 10 times even up. Mm-hmm. And that's therefore we should get the same because we're pretty similar and we're in the same market. Well, maybe, maybe not. Right. I mean, you can't you can't kind of go with that based solely on on that logic. Um, there's you've got to look at the individual merits because what they sold in that other deal across town may be very different from what you're selling. That's right. Um, the, the buyers that are going to potentially determine the valuation and the the multiples that can be applied. Obviously, a hospital isn't going to be using the same kind of uh, methodologies, much less the multiple themselves, as maybe a private equity sponsor would. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a lot of these things that you got to look at even region. If you're in a, a region um, where you have a high degree, high concentration of uh, capitation, let's just say, that may vary your uh, trends in uh, reimbursement, then that may determine the, the potential value or inherent value of a yeah. quote unquote enterprise. So, you know, there's there's so much nuance to valuation. It, it, we want to s- simplify it and break it down to simply a multiple of EBITDA. The reality is there's a lot more to it than that. And we may end up at, let's just say, seven and a half times EBITDA. That may be where we're in, but there's a lot that goes into that. To get there, and you can't just go broadly applying seven and a half to everything. The other thing about valuation is, well, I think it's tangential to valuation, but I want to break it down, and that is, I guess it's post transaction. But what what happens when we determine this is what your EBITDA, uh, you know, normalized EBITDA is? This is the multiple we're willing to pay, and it essentially comes out to X. Now what? How, how does that money get distributed? What are the variables there as far as distributing those those funds and supporting that inherent valuation? Yeah, that's a great uh, great topic to dwell on a little bit because it's very relevant. Comes up with every transaction. So if basically, if I own or part owner in a corporation and I'm selling equity and not just assets, but even if it were just assets only and not the actual equity, the stock, if you will, then the typical way that those proceeds are distributed would be, first of all, the entity would pay off any obligations, any debt, because typically the new owner, particularly if they're buying a majority interest, would not want to assume any debt. Now, That's in the negotiations, and needless to say, if they agree to assume debt, then that would lower the proceeds of the sale. But absent that, the actual net amount that would result that would go to the sellers would typically be based upon their equity. And that's really one of the major hurdles 
that you have to get through with practice transactions. By that, I mean most practices are equally owned. Every partner is an equal partner, and it's written into the bylaws in their operating agreement. And Dr. A owns, if it's 100 partners and each of them have 1%, then typically they would get 1% of the proceeds. Well, there's a lot of other things in play here. For example, there's Dr. A versus Dr. N. I'm just using letters. A may be twice as productive as N, work twice as hard, make twice as much. And and A would have the argument to say, well, I should get twice as much as N. Technically, if they're equal owners, that's what they get, equal. Now, there are ways to mitigate that, but it takes uh, an agreement among those partners, usually pre-closing of the transaction is how we're going to distribute and maybe even an amendment to the operating agreement that would allow such. There's also the issues when you do that as to whether or not it would qualify for capital gains, tax treatment, or ordinary income. If all we're doing is essentially recreating a, let me just use the term, income distribution plan, compensation plan, by saying that that Dr. A gets twice as much as Dr. N because he's twice as productive, and therefore that makes good sense. In my opinion, and I'm not, I emphasize not a tax expert, but what I've been told is that you take the risk of that all of a sudden being ordinary income. Whereas if you're selling stock, it's almost always going to be capital gain treatment and the percentage of tax is significant between the two. So all this needs to be sorted out and agreed upon. And needless to say, and I know you and I have both seen this, Mark, uh, we've seen deals die on the vine because of these challenges that could not be overcome. Uh, you couldn't get a majority or supermajority vote among the partners because of this situation and the way it's allocated. So now, one of the reasons you might form a BSO and spin this separate entity off is you can kind of start over and you can create within your operating agreement, a methodology for distributing the proceeds of the sale. So you, you, before you even, or as you're creating the operating agreement and the rules, if you will, for distributing the proceeds of a sale to the partners, you can write the script, if you will, uh, to accommodate what it is you want to address at that point, even to the point of as I said earlier, bringing in junior partners or associate partners to the MSO to give them a piece of the of the apple. So uh, that's yet again another reason in keeping with the theme of this podcast, why BSOs might even be formed. Yeah. But these are all uh, once again, there's no real right or wrong, but you will have to adhere to whatever legal formation you've set up. And last but not least, then there's the issue of what kind of legal entity you form. If it's an S-Corp, uh, it's our understanding it can be even more challenging. Obviously, you have a limited number of shareholders there uh, than a C. And then an LLC uh, is probably a little more flexible as it usually is. But once again, there are all kinds of uh, challenges confronting you when you're trying to figure out how to distribute these proceeds and 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 that tax impact that's right you said. Yeah. potentially if you're changing the the type of entity uh potential tax issues there as well and, and changing from an s to a c is not hard as i understand it but it's virtually well i won't say impossible but very difficult to convert from a uh uh, C to an S. I may have that backwards, but regardless, check with your tax advisor. It's not some of these changes of entities are not uh, not that easy uh, and to do. You made the point, but I want to make sure we emphasize that the talking about the valuation, the fundamental. We're talking about services at companies here, right? We're not talking mm-hmm. about manufacturing. Right. We're not talking about um, you know uh, entity with significant, you know, hard assets and intangible or, uh, you know, tangible value. We're talking about services companies and the, the value of those services is directly tied to the providers, right. the physicians. So if you are at risk of losing 
even just one, even just one doctor in some of these transactions, that can significantly erode the assumptions that led to that valuation, thereby reducing the valuation sure. itself, the number. So when you think about distributions on the back end of this or allocating the proceeds of the transaction, it's very important to understand that, yeah, the partners certainly are going to drive this. Uh, that's where you know they are the ones that deserve the majority of the proceeds. But hey, these, uh, let's just call them non-partner physicians or mm-hmm. non-partner providers, mm-hmm. maybe junior partners, whatever it may be. I think you, you even use the term probationary partners, but basically non-partnered contributors to value, you, you got to take care of them because if you lose them, then that's taken away a portion of that value. Right. So you, you have to consider that. And we've seen different ways of that happening. Sometimes you carve out a portion of those proceeds. The, all the partners agree to say, hey, a portion of the proceeds are going to go over to retention of these uh, employed providers or whatever it may be. And yeah. And it, it, uh, it even applies to administrative yeah. staff too. Again, that Maybe where the BSO ownership, uh, by the way, that's another reason to have a BSO is because it's not a professional entity like a, a PC or PLLC that has to only, the owners has to only be members of that profession, i.e. physicians. Uh, you can create more equity uh, among non-physician providers. But back to the point you were making, I'll just reiterate that whether you call them associates or probationary partners, uh, typically at any given time in a growing practice, when they do a private equity deal, there's going to be a number of physicians that are on that track, but they're not there yet. We're working with a group that, a, a huge single specialty group, and and I think the length of time from day one till you become a partner, and I'm sure there's some other hurdles, uh, is seven years. Well, at the point of a private equity transaction that they may be contemplating, you've got partners at two, three, four, five, six years. They're not partners and they won't vote. But to your point, they deserve a piece of, as I call it, the apple. And maybe by the time the second bite of the apple comes around, they will be partners. And that goes without saying they'll participate. But it's wise for the then partners to say, okay, we've got this money coming in. You know what? We need to open up a part of it, and it may be a relatively small amount, 10%, 20%, whatever. And let's figure out a way to distribute it to these uh, soon-to-be partners, and, and it serves as a retention tool for them. And by the same way, the administrative leadership of the practice. And again, that could be through the BSO, but if you don't have a BSO, you can still potentially do it uh, directly through the practice proceeds. And these these are incredibly important things to consider uh, as you're looking at a private equity deal. Hospital deals, not so much. Uh, they're not in play. Uh, usually we're not dealing with the kind of upfront dollars, needless to say, in a hospital transaction. Uh, we do work on what we call a private equity like model for hospitals. We won't get into that, but if you're interested, let us know. Uh, but those are are not as typical as as your standard hospital transactions, where very little upfront money is usually in play. Yeah. The the last thing I just want to close the loop on this, and but I, I did want to cover post transaction, and and we didn't make this distinction, but a lot of these deals are not 100% deals, meaning you're not selling off 100% of the BSO. Right. So let's just say, for instance, the private equity buyer came in and, and wanted to buy your group, wanted to invest in your BSO, but it's going to function as more of a joint venture. And you're going to say you're going to retain a portion of interest. And of right. course, that can be any percentage in theory. But for the sake of argument, let's just say it's kind of a 49-51 thing, essentially 50-50. So you retain essentially half interest in this entity. You're going to continue to get distributions, I assume, from that. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's going to be kind of go forward income or continued income, but it will be less than what you're making when you own 100%, obviously. But then... The idea, I guess, is that, and I'll let you speak to this, but the idea is that there is growth opportunity there, meaning now that you're partially owned by this new partner, then you can kind of expand these services, support more of their groups, 
get you know more fees off those groups uh, throughout the entire network or something like that. But uh, the management fee is important because you're still getting paid for your professional services uh, on the practice as well as for your ownership in the BSO. How does that work and, and what are some of the nuances? It can be, once again, a very huge challenge to getting the deal to be approved because typically on the practice side, in order to create value in the practice and money up front, needless to say, the physicians take a compensation reduction. We call it a haircut. So they're already taking less pay. And then if we have this BSO and it has a markup, a profit margin in it, that's great because to use your example, let's say the doctors retain 49% or the practice side does, then they'll get 49% of what would presumably be a higher profit than the BSO would otherwise make if they weren't charging this premium. And that will help offset part of their loss in the practice, but still the net of the two is probably not going to be quite as good as the total income that the physician enjoyed prior to the transaction. Now, having said that, we admit that they've got more money up front. So that's part of the offset. And then the rest of it has to come, well, there's two things. You alluded to one, and that is the potential to take this new co, if you will, whether it's the BSO or the new ownership of the practice, and grow it. So to the extent that we have more capital, more wherewithal to invest and expand and create a better bottom line, the physicians will enjoy that, whereas they may not have if they just stood still and not done the deal. Even without owning 100%. That's right. Yeah. And then the last component or potential opportunity is what I've already talked about and alluded to, and I call it the second bite of the apple. And so let's just say we have this BSO or the practice or both, and the physicians have retained a minority interest and, you know, three, four years go by and things are going pretty well. And the private equity firm would typically look to flip it. That's the kind of business they're in. They're not in long-term, typically long-term owners. So they come back and they find another larger private equity firm or whatnot, operating entity perhaps, and you sell it for an additional multiple. So you get in your 49% interest that you retain, somewhere down the road, you will get an additional amount of proceeds, presumably at a marked up enhanced value. So really those three methodologies or or uh, touch points of additional income that I just stated I won't repeat them are potentially in play but you know we we also and I think as we wind this up I'll just say doing a private equity deal really varies with the physicians and where they are in their life and their career a great deal and it's really hard to bring a consensus about among younger and older physicians. Not surprisingly, older physicians are ready to do a deal. It's a succession plan. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes good sense. And they can see the end of their career in plain view. Younger physicians obviously have 10, 15, 20, 25 years left to practice, and they have concerns about, is this the right way to go? Am I hitching my wagon to the right partner, et cetera. And so all these things really need to be considered. And uh, even if you're a older physician, you wonder about, well, will I even stick around to get that second bite of the apple? You know, that's five years down the road. I may be gone in two years. Well, okay. Maybe there's a way to mitigate that. Uh, if I'm a younger doctor, I'm not so concerned about the upfront money now because I really need more income to pay for my kids' college and so forth. And yet, you know, I kind of like that second bite of the apple uh, five, six, ten years from now, and maybe even a third one, by the way. So we, we really have to do a balancing act here when we're working on private equity deals uh, with groups. And obviously, as we would, even if it were a hospital deal, we try to configure it in such a way where not everybody is hurt. By it, there's, there's always, there, it's not going to be perfect for anybody, but we try to reach some common ground where it's uh, 
I use the term sometimes tongue in cheek. Everybody is equally displeased. Hopefully that's not the case, but sometimes that seems the way to be the way it works. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great point to kind of close the loop because, uh, I mean, we've just raised the surface as far as the different variables and, and nuances to these types of deals. We are, I think the point is we are seeing more and more of these and, uh, and we're getting more and more questions related to exploring these, maybe a, a specific offer, specific proposal, a specific partner, or kind of going out into the market and you know, seeking the, these types of opportunities and partners. So Hopefully this was a good a good kind of overview, and, and obviously it's tied specifically to MSOs or BSOs. Um, but we've talked about different valuation methodologies. You, you alluded to the private equity like model, so it, there are options too. If you're a hospital and you're looking to compete with private equity, um, if you are a group and you're you, you explore private equity, but hey, maybe there's a deal to be done with the hospital uh, or health system that you know can can have some significant upside or comparable upside as well and then there's lots of other things as it relates to these deals and uh we'll continue to talk about these but as always you know as people have questions or if there's something we didn't go into detail on uh feel free to reach out to us but other than that thanks for uh coming on and talking uh high level overview on msos and private equity deals and we'll look forward to uh talking more about this in the future great thank you